Hi, I'm Dr. Michael Gardner, double board certified plastic surgeon. And I've been asked to react to this video, the race to find the first anti-aging drug. So let's see what's new in this field and let's check it out. Over the past 10 years or so, longevity has developed something of a niche cult following on social media with prominent figures like tech founder, Brian Johnson. His house has turned into what looks like a pharmacy as he takes more than a hundred pills every day. <laughs> this guy's kind of obsessed with this. He has a thing called Blueprint and he's experimenting. I heard he's down to 30 drugs now, down from a hundred. First one down. But getting trials approved for a longevity pill has been nearly impossible. There's no playbook as to how to develop a drug in the space. It's really the wild west. Now, at least one company might finally be close to approving an anti-aging drug. So this is a developing field, especially the last 10 years. A lot of people with a lot of money have thrown a lot at this because I guess they're all these new tech millionaires and they want to live longer. So they're like Brian Johnson and others. They're all spending a lot of money investing in this to see if they could develop something to make them live longer. But living longer has not been successful by this means yet. The way to traditionally live longer is basically take good care of yourself by good exercise or on a regular basis eating well, more of a Mediterranean diet, and keeping your weight where it should be within a normal BMI as opposed to being obese. And staying away from smoking, drinking, and other chemicals that can uh, cause mutations in your DNA. But basically living long right now really depends on one's DNA and all these other things really haven't been shown to give much of a result. Except it's for dogs. Fun fact, I was embarrassed to say the phrase dog longevity for like the first six months of loyal because of the looks that people would give me. So here's a pill for dogs because dogs have a shorter lifespan. If you really want to do it, which I'm sure they're doing it now, you could do a rat and mouse which is even shorter and conduct more experiments that way. So why is it so difficult to get a longevity pill approved for humans? I'm Hilary Brick and I cover health at Business Insider. To get a drug approved by the FDA, companies first need to pinpoint which health issue they want to target. It has to be something measurable like blood pressure, or vision. The work starts in preclinical research, phase zero, when scientists test their theories in a lab using computers, cells, or animal models. If those results look good, they submit a plan to the FDA for testing on humans. The clinical trial process then has three phases that can each take years. They answer different questions like, how safe is the drug? How effective is it? And how does it work in combination with other treatments? Anti-aging medication, you have to like follow somebody for like their lifespan. So, you know, that's gonna be rather difficult in humans. That's why they go to other animals. Which human is gonna be the first to take these things? You know, they could shorten your life. They could have side effects. So, you know, it's a little bit of a risk for that person. A lot of these sometimes medications are used for cancer. And so they get it approved and they use it on like end stage kinds of cancer patients who basically have no other alternative and their end is gonna happen. So they think as a last desperate attempt, they'll take this new research method, pill, whatever it may be. But that's not for anti-aging. You know, who's gonna, the purpose is to live longer and healthier and uh, live an abundant lifestyle. And so who's gonna really take that? But most drugs don't make it through the entire process, and no drugs targeting aging have even reached the first phase of human testing yet. One big reason for this is we don't yet have a complete picture of how aging really works. That's because aging isn't caused by just one thing. It's a mix of how our genes, environment, and lifestyle interact. So you can't easily measure it. What people don't realize that it's this biology of aging that drives the diseases. And also it depends on where you live. Certain areas might have more smog, higher rates of cancer than other areas as well. As an example, you can be born with genes for Alzheimer's. You need the aging to bring it up. We now understand that we have to prevent this aging. We have to stop this aging. And this is the revolution that we're leading. But aging isn't classified as a disease by health regulators. And because of that, it's hard to imagine what a true anti-aging pill would look like. We get really hung up on the idea that we really have to understand these things, you know, in very great detail before we can use them. 
And that's not true for aging. It's not really true for any drug that's been approved. Well, you're taking risks on safety when you do that. So that's an argument, I guess, for another day. We don't really need to understand everything to be able to use these things in an effective way. Graying hair, wrinkling skin, increased body fat, loss of lean mass. Hypothetically, yeah, there's no biological principle that says we can't stop the biological aging process or even in some cases reverse it. That's interesting. I wonder if he's going to be the first to volunteer to take some of these things. But since that isn't being done in humans just yet, some scientists have found more short-lived trial subjects, hoping to see faster results. Dogs age biologically about seven times faster than people. They get all of the same functional declines and diseases that we do, it just happens faster. Now it turns out dogs might get a pill before we do. Celine Halua founded a startup called Loyal that is developing three drugs. Well, of course that's the case. No one's gonna jump right away to humans. We always try animals first. First you try a rat mouse, and then you can do something in a dog, and eventually a monkey, and then maybe try it on a human. One is for big dogs, which tend to die younger. And two, for almost all dog breeds, big to small. I thought you could do it in humans, but I would probably need a billion dollars. I was like, I can't raise a billion dollars. <laughs> um, but then we kind of had the crazy idea to work on dog lifespan extension. She's a dog lover herself with an 11 year old Rottweiler named Della. You know, I love my dog, so I'm not sure I'd want him to have this because what happens if it shortens his lifespan? I mean, you're experimenting on your dog. So if you love your pet, I think like I do, I, I think I'll pass. And she has raised $125 million and attracted some high-profile investors. If you were to tell me six years ago that I was going to invest in a company that was working to extend dog lifespan, I think I would have really, really had to wonder what were to happen to me over the coming years that would change, you know, in essence, come to such a crazy conclusion like that. One of the producers of Lord of the Rings is a, is a big investor in Loyal. Um, and he invested in part because he has a small dog named Pixie, who's a senior dog, who he loves more than anything. <laughs> it's not that approving a drug for dogs is necessarily any easier. There's still the same kind of safety requirements as there are for people. But it is a lot faster because dogs live shorter lifetimes. Because it's a brand new field, the aging field does not have established regulatory paths um, with regulatory bodies like the FDA. That's similar to the supplements. It's not really regulated by the FDA. So they make all these claims on supplements and do all these things. And there's no scientific evidence many times to back that up at all. It makes it one of the most exciting spaces to, to watch and be in over the coming decades. Now the challenge is to convince regulators the drug is working. And they're close. In November 2023, the FDA signaled a first vote of confidence in Loyal's initial drug with a reasonable expectation of effectiveness. What's reasonable? Is that the dog is living a day longer, a week longer, a month longer? And how do you know that dog would have not lived that length anyway? I'd like to see that to see how they define reasonable expectation there. That's a critical first step towards conditional drug approval for a longevity pill. Hallua says if everything goes well, the first drug might be available by the end of 2025. It's being tested in vet offices around the country right now. And she says her goal is to make it affordable since many owners pay their vet bills out of pocket. The hope is that it can lead to more breakthroughs for humans too. That's a big hope. For humans, there might be some answers hiding in cheap generic drugs that are widely available already. Metformin is one of those drugs. It was initially used to treat the flu in Europe. Nowadays, it's one of the most commonly prescribed drugs for diabetes. It costs like 20 cents. It's an extract of the French lilac. It's the cheapest drug in the, the formulary in the United States or, or probably all over the world. So I was aware of this by some of my uh, clients and patients saying they want to live longer, so they're taking metformin. And they told me there are some studies out there that show this. So the studies are very weak, though, uh, and there are no long-term studies on this. And there are side effects to metformin. It actually can cause muscle atrophy. So your muscles get weaker the longer you're on this. So to compensate, you have to work out, I guess, a lot in the gym to make up for it or to stay the same muscle tone that you are now. You have to work out a lot if you're on metformin. So you always have to see are the side effects worth the result. But metformin goes beyond just controlling blood sugar. In the early 2000s, scientists started noticing that the drug may help reduce some common age-related symptoms. He is may 
may, not definitely. Because it acts on key metabolic pathways that drive how our body uses energy. These effects could influence some age-related conditions like inflammation, cancer, and fat storage. And it's usually given for diabetics type 2 who are obese. So if those diabetics lose the weight while they're on metformin, or if they lose the weight without metformin, they're going to live longer. Losing weight. Obesity kills people sooner. You don't see too many 300-pound 90-year-olds walking around, right? Most 90-year-olds are pretty thin, and that's why they're living that long. People on metformin have less cardiovascular disease. They have less cognitive decline in Alzheimer's. They have less cancers. Their mortality is decreased. And that is because metformin is not really an anti-diabetic drug. It's kind of an anti-aging drug. We call it gerotherapeutics. Once again, that research is a little bit on the weak side. They really have to do more substantial studies to prove metformin really does this. People should always consult a healthcare professional before considering new treatments. But Nir is so convinced that metformin has promise for aging that he started taking it himself. And he imagines a world where, like him, lots of older adults could take this simple 20-cent white pill and potentially see anti-aging benefits like less cancer, smaller amounts of dangerous visceral belly fat, and just better health. But Nir says the ultimate goal is to see who these different repurposed drugs work best for, then fine-tune the approach in order to find and develop even better new anti-aging drugs. We're not done. We can get better drugs and more drugs and combination of drugs and drugs that will be better for maybe one disease versus the others. Maybe metformin will give us... So I guess this guy's saying, do drugs. Give us a couple of years, a few years, but we can go farther. Another drug that's already on the market and that is gaining popularity right now for anti-aging is called rapamycin. It's an antifungal compound scientists found in the 1960s, hiding in a clump of dirt on a remote island in the Pacific Ocean. So that island's called Easter Island. It's very remote in the Pacific. This is a true story. And rapamycin is used for transplant patients because it decreases the immune system. But this uh, medication has a whole host of side effects. At this point, I'm not volunteering to take it. At first, rapamycin was approved to weaken the body's immune response. It acts on a protein called mTOR. That stands for mammalian target of rapamycin. It's a protein that helps control how cells grow and work. When mTOR is turned down, immune cells slow down and don't react as strongly. This is useful because it prevents the body from overreacting to things like an organ transplant when the body might try to reject that new organ. So as per FDA approval, this drug is now given to help transplant patients accept their new organs, like a new kidney. But about a decade ago, researchers saw that mice taking rapamycin had their life expectancy increased by up to 50%. Then in 2014, another study, this time in elderly people, showed rapamycin improved their immune function. Low doses of rapamycin in aged individuals can actually lead to an improvement in the ability of the immune system to do what it's supposed to do, like respond to vaccines, potentially surveil cancer. In small doses? Now they say small doses, so you can still have side effects in small doses, but you're probably minimizing the amount of side effects you have. But this medication has a lot of side effects. In small doses, rapamycin seems to be able to tell old bodies to just kind of settle down, reduce overreaction that leads to inflammation and tissue damage and key age-related issues. Again, rapamycin has not been approved by the FDA for anti-aging purposes, and robust clinical data is still missing. Even though it could speed things up since these pills have already been tested for safety and proven effective in other areas, it's hard to get independent investors or even big drug companies excited about cheap drugs that are already available. I'm not sure about this one. I'm gonna pass on this. It seems to have a lot of uh, questionable side effects to it. The hype is very much there, at least for influencers like Brian Johnson. Some pills I take, I take every day. Sometimes I take them twice a day. Sometimes I take once every two weeks, for example, rapamycin. That's also because it's very easy to get these drugs. They're taking advantage of what's called off-label use. Doctors can use any FDA-approved prescription drug as they see fit, writing a prescription for someone, even if they don't have the condition listed on the bottle. That doesn't mean people should just run to the pharmacy to get metformin or rapamycin, because we don't know enough about how these drugs affect long-term health in the context of aging. Though early research is intriguing, it's still preliminary. Very preliminary. 
there are limitations. Metformin is not good for young people. It decreases their growth hormone level. It decreases in men the testosterone sometimes. It prevents them to get their muscle to be as big if, if they exercise as without metformin. So this is not a drug for young people. This is a drug for somebody who starts to have this breakdown of aging. So decreased testosterone is a real problem, especially in older individuals. Uh, decreases your energy and everything. Uh, decreases bone mass and a lot of different things. So if you're on this drug, you may want to get uh, levels taken. It should be done under the guidance of a physician. In the past 150 years, the expected lifespan in the US has doubled. That's mainly because we did a lot of prevention that allowed us to live longer by developing vaccines, building sewers, and infrastructure for clean water. So we do live longer, but not necessarily better all the way until the end. That's better than 200 years ago. And we do live better. Having clean water and clean toilets is living better than before. Now we're more likely to spend those last years struggling with health issues like Alzheimer's, cancer, or cardiovascular disease. The longer you live, you're going to have other problems. So if we live to 135, maybe there's some new disease or something out there that's going to be a problem at that age. Scientists believe that all this research could lead to new, exciting, more profitable pathways for creating effective anti-aging drugs. Moving beyond quirky treatments like lilac or dirt fungi to something that truly works for aging. The promise in biotech is that we'll have much more potent drug so we can it extend our health span not by a couple of years or five years, but 35 years. That would not only help people live healthier lives, but some argue the benefits to our society would be huge. Definitely would be to have people more productive longer. So I agree with all that. I think the value from being able to deliver to humans extra productive years and healthy life um, is almost unquantifiable. There's economical value of not being in the hospital because they travel and they shop and they buy houses for their kids. It's 360, something like that, trillions dollars over 10 years if we just extend healthspan by a year or two. So, there you go. If you like these videos, subscribe and hit the like button and there'll be more on the way.